Right, uh, Team Biz News, we have microphones, two on this side, two on that side. There's a question in the front here. If you'd like to ask a question, <laughs> please put your hand up. John, can you give us an assurance that under no circumstances the DA would go into coalition with the ANC? And if you can't, under what circumstances would that be? I've already given that. So that's what the multi-party charter document says. That we've all committed to not doing deals with the with the ANC or the EFF. And uh, I've signed that document on behalf of the DA, and and that's the document. So um, it's, it's it's not a debate. We've already done it. It's in black and white. Thanks for asking that question. It seems like I've scared everybody else. They don't want to. Uh, it's it's not really that bad. There's uh, John. My question is. <clears throat> There's a perception, particularly on social media, that the DA is doing a good job of appealing to the minds of South Africans, but not to their hearts. Given the immaturity of our democracy, how are you going to get across that perceived hurdle uh, and capture the hearts of South Africa, not their minds? I think that's an easy question to answer by showing rather than telling. And I think that's where the DA goes into this election with an advantage. We govern, and we govern well. And as I said, we're not perfect. The Oberstrand's great, but it's not perfect. I hope Alan Lee's not in the room. Oh, she is there. Yeah. But she'll also be the first to admit, I mean, we don't get it right all the time. But, I mean, are we much better than anywhere else in the country? Absolutely. And I think being able to go into an election that's going to be about jobs and the economy and to be able to show how you've, not tell, not put a manifesto up about how you're going to do it, show how you've created a job-growing economy in the Western Cape that created 300,000 new jobs in last year, how you're able to bring crime down by 14% year on year on priority crimes. But I'm with you. That's the head. No, it's not that's the head. head. That's, Where's the that's, emotion? That's, that's, the, that's a lived experience of people. That's, that's speaking to the person who's sitting around a table, unable to feed their family every single night, and has to look at hungry children or mothers in the Eastern Cape who you know, are, are literally you know, suicidal because they can no longer hear their, their children's cries anymore. Those are, those are the hard things, and you've got to show those people, not tell them how you're going to get them from that shack into a house, how you're going to get their children into, into a better future. And I think it's, it's through showing rather than telling. Anybody can tell. Telling's from the head. I can put up uh, formulas and all sorts of things showing it, being, uh, uh, telling you, but showing you how what low-cost housing or social housing looks like in the Western Cape, what a working police station looks like, what a LEAP program that's keeping your, your mothers and, and, and grandmothers safe walking to and from a taxi. Those are the things that move the needle in a big way, and I think that's why we're growing. If we were all rational in this country, it would be a one-horse race. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Uh, let's, yeah. Um, I listened to the seven points of the manifesto, but I didn't hear anything about education, which, well, um, which I think is one of the biggest um, drives that this country should have, is to get the people educated. Yeah. So what's the DI planning around that? Well, there's a big extensive part of it in the manifesto, and it is one of the seven points. It's around tripling the number of grade four learners who can read for meaning. You cannot compete in the modern world of work if you cannot read, write, and compute. And you've got to break the stranglehold of unions on teaching. You've got to re-empower school governing bodies and head teachers to be able to run schools rather than trying to run them from district offices. And you've got to focus like a laser beam on teacher standards. Because the SATU has protected our teachers in the country for far too long from teacher standards. To the point now where I think it's 60% of grade six educators can't pass exams that they're setting for their children. We've got to radically overhaul the way we educate children. And the example that we're using here in the, in the Western Cape, how we're getting uh, on top of the school infrastructure backlog through rapid build schools, there's a full section of the manifesto because I agree with you 100%. In the medium to long term, we have to radically uplift our numeracy, literacy skills in the country to give our children a fighting chance of competing in a world where they're not only competing now against African countries and international countries, you're competing against the internet and AI, and we need to equip our children for, for that new reality. 
Yes, Mr. Stilazen, thank you very much for that talk, very interesting talk. So my question is, what's the room for more devolution in the Western Cape? So what's standing in the way and what would that look practically? So what, what could you do? What could you take over uh, in terms of uh, helping the people? Yeah, great. Uh, that's a great question. And um, it's, it's going to go to the heart of one of the reasons why we want to get into national government is because you have to be able to have a national government that is that is amenable to devolving and devolving powers. And this dogged determination of the current government and the current um, ideology is to centralize big clunking fist of state, centrally Pretoria must decide on everything that happens, is precisely what's holding our ports back from being efficient and effective and preventing public-private partnerships there. It's precisely what's ingraining the stubborn high crime rate where 75 people are murdered every single day because national government won't, re won't relinquish these powers. It's what's holding us from integrating our transport systems so that you can move seamlessly between taxi, bus, and train uh, and, and commute and take cars off the road. And you need to have a national government that is willing to be able to let those powers go where they better serve at a provincial and capable local government. And there's no impediment, and don't let Becky Trell and others say to you that there's an impediment. There is no impediment. Any function performed at a national level can be devolved in terms of our constitution without a single amendment down to another sphere of government. All you need to do is change the people that are sitting around the table in the union buildings and get people who, like the IFP and ourselves and others who believe in federalism and believe in devolution of power to a lower common denominator into those buildings and around that table so that we can push this even further. It's best practice in many, many countries and successful countries around the world. This dogged determination to hold stubbornly onto every single power is holding the country back in a, in a significant way. Yeah. How do we enlighten and educate people that a socialist government is the solution to their problems? Okay, I, I heard it, and I know the people on this side didn't. How do we enlighten people who believe that a socialist government is the way forward? Is that about right? Okay. Yeah. Well, I think it's about demonstrating to them the difference between the two forms of government and being able to show them the outcomes uh, and being able to do so in a very stark way, showing them you know, why is there a massive exodus from Zimbabwe? It's because of the socialist policies that are being applied there. People are hungry, they're unemployed, and those policies have driven them from their homes. The greatest human displacement in modern history was from Venezuela out to other countries because the socialist policies there have led to greater unemployment, greater hunger, um, loss of, of body mass even. And you've never seen people uh, running in rafts towards a socialist country. It's always away from a socialist country. I think it's to be able to show people the consequences of what happens, that the only people who get rich in a socialist system are the elite. And it's the, it's the man on the street, the 30 million people who currently you know, are languishing in poverty who will be even... But we know, we know that, and I think that's the point. How do you get that message across to those who still sit in the, in the stadium and hear Malema saying, Putin is us, we are Putin, yeah. and think that it's a good thing? Well, I don't think that the majority of people do think that's a good thing. And I think that the polling shows that. Um, it's, you know, it's the majority of people in South Africa don't believe uh, what the, what, what's happened with Russia and Ukraine is correct. However, you've got to give those people encouragement. And this is where the rationalists sometimes lose the plot, is that you've got to be able to demonstrate every single day the difference between those, poli those policies and explain to people why they're getting the highest access to basic services. Why are you living in an environment where crime is going down and not up? Why are you living in an environment where your children now are getting taught coding, robotics, there's extra uh, makeup time on weekends and after hours? Why are you getting better health outcomes? Why are you getting more money spent on you as a citizen and less on the politicians? And showing that binary narrative and not talking about it, showing it and being able to show you what a socialist outcome looks like and then what a you know what a what a what a democratic outcome looks like
People are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. Yeah. I, I remember that from, from uh, guys who, who, who serve at the bottom end of the pyramid. Yeah. They say, if you want to really test something, give it to poor people. Mm. They really know what's yeah. going on. Okay. Thanks. I, I think it's very important for investors, maybe just to spend a few more seconds or at least commit to a nationally published um, article with regards to, to the DA's plan, if the ANC in fact does win with a small enough margin where it has to choose between the DA and either the EFF and NK, as you call it, the, the doomsday scenario. So my question to you is really, from an investor's perspective, what matters more, the in good faith agreed multi-party charter or the current talk is that ANC and IFP is a small, you know, there's a 48% or 47% IFP drags them over the line. So if there's other um, MPC um, um, partners that, that might negotiate with the ANC, is it, is it um, cast in stone what the MPC has agreed on? Or as you put it, priority number one is to avoid the doing yeah. scenario. And that is a lot for, for investors. Yeah. I think it's an important question, but there's an unknown, there's an X that we don't know. And that's who's sitting on the other side of the table. So people say, oh, you know, you must go and do a deal with the ANC. Who's sitting on the other side of the table when you have that, that discussion? Does Ramaphosa survive, uh, being the first ANC president to lose a majority? Are you sitting across the table from Masha Thiele, who's now mired in more state capture and corruption allegations than Jacob Zuma was? And you know, how do you do business with people on that basis? So that's why I said it's going to be very important to see those cards that are dealt by the electorate because you cannot make a play until you know what those cards are. You cannot decide whether to hold on to your hand until you know, you've, seen, you, you, you've seen the flop. You want, you want to, be able to, to, to be able to make an, a, an assessment. And I know that there's a lot of people who simplistically say, well, DA plus ANC equals stability. Well, ZANU PF and MDC didn't bring stability to, to Zimbabwe. And in fact, what it did was it ended up extending ZANU PF's stay in power. So you know, it's a tough question to answer, but I would say that you've always got to put South Africa's interests first and do what's right by the country and your voters. So we will go back to our partners in the multi-party charter after the election to look at where we've ended up and what our next move is, and also back to our voters and say, what do you want us to do with the cards that have now been dealt to us here? But you can only do that when you know what's going to be sitting on the other side of the table. Because I couldn't think of anything worse than going into government with Paul Mashatile, Fakine Mbulule, Gwede Mantashe, and the other capturists uh, sitting around the cabinet table with you. That's not going to be the, the chemotherapy that South Africa requires. And I think it's going, to, it's going to cost us going forward. And it could actually hurt the opposition cause in the longer term. But as I said, these are all... These are, there's too many X's for me to be able to unequivocally say X, Y, and Z is going to, going to be, the, be the result. Hey, John. Um, given the fact that we are aware of the possibility of the Doomsday Pact happening, uh, what would be the day's stance on Cape Independence if something like that happens? Yeah. Well, I suppose we'd have to, have to look at it. Um, it it's, I, I think if the Doomsday Pact get in, your chances of getting national legislation that is required to you know, allow referendums to take place is going to, to evaporate faster than the new dawn because there's no way they're going, to let, they're going to let a large economically active part of South Africa just you know, go off on its own. And you know, you're going to have a government at a central level that doesn't believe in federalism, that believes fundamentally in holding on to things. So I think you're going to have a, a tough time, which is why... The Constitutional Court recently ruled that there can't be a provincial referendum because there is no enabling national legislation yet and that they're waiting for the, the parliamentary process to, to create that national legislation which has never been given birth to. If a doomsday pact gets in at a national level, that legislation's dead in the water. If the NPC gets in, we can get that legislation through Parliament in the first year and then we can start having a more informed debate about precisely this. But I think the question was a bit different. It was, if the doomsday pact gets in, what then happens to the pressures? And it comes back to something I asked in our conversation mm -hmm. for Cape Independence. We've seen more, uh, uh, perhaps, momentum for that cause the more you hear that somebody here 
is going to be ruled by a government that they didn't vote into power. I'm saying to you that it's going to be very difficult to lead a independence movement in an environment where you have a government in place that's implacably opposed to it. I think the MPC and certainly our party has made it very clear that we believe in devolution and enabling legislation to give effect to what the constitution recognizes as a right to provincial referenda that would you would need in order to fulfill that step to be able to to get the secession. You can't just secede without a referendum to know that the majority of people are there. I'm saying that your first step has got to be getting that legislation passed. Unless you have a you know a violent separate separatist movement or you 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 start to, to lead an armed revolution away, the only way you're going to do it is by constitutionally making sure that the inf the constitutional infrastructure is in place to facilitate it. And that's what we committed to doing. That's why we tabled the referendum um, bill in Parliament, precisely to fill the lacuna that has been created by the absence of enabling national legislation to allow for a referendum, not only for independence debates, but also to be able to gauge provinces on different things. And I think that, that with the prospect of more provinces falling to the opposition in the next election, I think this increases the opportunity rather than decreases it. My question is, can we introduce voter education at qualification so that the voter can also vote for direct representation from ward level going up and that we want to go back to the gold standard? Okay, well, I mean, I think that uh, electoral reform is essential. And I do think that there is a growing disconnect between the electors and the elected. And I think we do need to move to a system where people can directly vote for their MPs and, and hold them accountable that way. And I think that systems that do that around the world, there is greater accountability and you reduce the gap between the electors and the elected. Uh, I think that brings greater trust in institutions. And I think it puts the power back in the hands of people rather than parties about who represents them. At the moment, the, the list system uh, you know, is is used, the proportional system is used, but I would favor a move towards of a more of a mixed system where you have directly elected, but you also have a proportional representation top up to ensure that there is still a multiplicity of voices uh, being heard. If you move to a pure constituency system in the country, I think the ANC would probably end up with an over two thirds majority, massively over. Uh, and I do think that one of the beauties about our system is that there are a multiplicity of voices that are heard. But do we need electoral reform? Absolutely. This current electoral reform has been a dog's breakfast, and you know it's now created constitutional problems and practical problems um, with trying to introduce independence now into a system that's designed purely on, on, on proportional representation. And I think it's going to be very, very difficult to be able to, to navigate. John C. Nelson, thank you for Is it over? today. It's... Uh, it's all done. Thank you. Thank you.